Good morning, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session, Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. And today we are going to talk about, briefly about, Kamala Harris's silence, you know, relative silence, I should say, about her father. Not much information is given as regards Kamala Harris's, the current um, Democratic nominee for the presidency of the United States. And people wonder why has she decided to be so silent on the relationship between she and her father. We get to understand um, that she did not have that a very close relationship with her father growing up. Now, we understand that both parents are immigrants. Her mother immigrated from India and her father from Jamaica. Her mother was a cancer research scientist while her father was a prominent economist. And uh, both of them uh, pursued PhD studies at the University of California, Berkeley, for the University of Berkeley. Um, now, the fact of the matter is that during their tenure at the university, they met and they participated in the civil rights movement. And we know that there were radical events and radical protest actions that were, um, you know, effectuated in California at the time. And they, as immigrants, participated in these civil rights activities. Now, we must understand that in the 1960s, life in the United States was different. And we had segregation and uh, lots of people of color, particularly Black people, did not have the rights and the privileges which they do uh, for the most part. Uh, enjoy in the United States at the moment. So Kamala Harris's mother, that is uh, Shaimala Gopalan, and Donald Harris from Jamaica decided that they would also uh, participate in these activities as people of color. You know, they were not known to be so-called white people. So they thought that they would participate. It was something exciting for them coming from two former British colonies. Jamaica was a former British colony and so was India. So when they came, it seemed to me that they were part of the Black Student Association and in which they also had a study group. And they studied, they read books on history, they would have read books on civil rights and they, you know, they joined hands and heart together and they eventually fell in love and they got married sometime around 1963. But the marriage did not last long. Now, after the marriage in 1963, Kamala was born in 1964 and uh, Maya, uh, what's her name, the, her sister would have been born, that is uh, Maya, would have been born in 1966 or 1967, I think it's two or three years later that she was born. Now, the, 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 the marriage ended up in a first separation. They separated in 1972. Some accounts say 1971, some accounts say 1972, uh, because Kamala said she was seven when they were separated. So that would have been around about 1971, because she was born, I think she's born at her birth date is October 20th, 1964. So seven years forward would be 1971. And she said that they separated when she was seven years old. Now, in Kamala's uh, memoir, that is her autobiography, she did mention that she, you know, the, the, the relationship became fractious and that the parents were not able to live together. She did lament and she did acknowledge that if the parents were more mature at the time, because they were young people, because when we think about it, Mayala went, Shamala, sorry, not Mayala, but Shamala or Shyamala, I think, Gopalan, immigrated to the United States when she was 16 years, 19 years old, I beg your pardon. So she was 19 years old when she um, went to the United States. I think she went there to pursue first a master's in, um, in nutrition and endocrinology. And then she wound up getting a PhD in those two areas also, uh, after which she taught in the United States and she traveled to Canada where she also 
worked at the university as a research, a cancer research scientist at Magill University in Canada. And she also worked at a Jewish general hospital in Canada. Now, the marital relationship, you know, ended up in a divorce. Um, it seems to me some years later, because according to what Kamala has said, I think she was around about 12 when they actually divorced. I think just before she moved to, to Canada that they actually filed their divorce papers. So the parents were officially divorced sometimes about when Kamala was 12 years old. So that would have been six years after the separation. Now it was, it you know, based on what Kamala Harris's father has said, Donald Harris, the divorce was very, very um, toxic, right? And uh, um, acrimonious, and that both parties, we understand that they were seeking custody, which is natural of the children, and the custody was given over to Shaimala, uh, because at the time, I think she had allowed that Shaimala, that's uh, Kamala Harris's mother, had allowed the lawyer, her lawyer, to argue the case that he was a Black man, that Donald Harris was a Black man, and that he perhaps would not have been responsible to take care of his children, his two daughters. I mean, <laughs> given the, even though he was a prominent professor and of course at Stanford University at the time. Now it's important to note that while Kamala is denying her father uh, or just giving just a brief footnote as New York Times suggests, you know, we must understand that this is a prominent, according to the New York Times and other sources, a very prominent economist in the world who has worked in many countries, taught at many universities, and was also um, an advisor, economic advisor to many sitting Jamaican prime ministers. So it's interesting to note that she would be not rendering um, much attention. She's just rendering a footnote to him rather than perhaps showcasing the uh, you know, relationship that might not have been close, that might have been rocky sometimes, but I'm sure that he is the only you know, uh, uh, parent alive. It's very strange that she would not have had some sort of connection. Now, at the time also when Kamala Harris lacks policies, she lacks any sort of economic policy. She has not fleshed out. She has not clearly articulated any economic policy that she would like to implement if she should become the next president of the United States. And one would have thought that her father, who is an economist, a world-renowned economist, whether he's Marxist or he's whatever you want to call him, because you know we have the San Francisco Daily calling him you know, a radical Marxist, at his time. And, you know, even the New York Times, you know, had an article in which I think they were quoting somebody, though they said that Donald Harris was a very clear communicator. But he, even though he was very clear and he wrote very, very well, right? Um, he, he a lot of times his ideologies were always couched in obscentorist um, you know, Marxian or Marxist ideologies, right? So he had these very complicated, if you will, um, ideas that people were not able to grasp to understand, right? Because he was, in fact, according to them, a very radical Marxist, or whatever that means, because I don't think there's any radical Marxist in many of these universities, they, you know, they express Marxism and they might agree with um, Karl Marx and his communist ideology, but radical, I don't know, right? Um, I think that that might be a gross exaggeration on the part of the U.S. media. But Kamala Harris would certainly need some amount of guidance from her father in terms of her economic policies to flesh them out to be able to speak about them. I find her too much engaged in, you know, superficial stuff, stuff that really doesn't matter. She has a lot of cooking videos online and she often talks about, um, you know, abortion. And 
matters that you know are not necessarily bread and butter matters and many americans are concerned about bread and and butter matters because they understand that many of them are not doing well economically so why would she not engage her father who has a brilliant mind whether or not she agrees with all of his policies but at least to engage him in her in in fleshing out some viable economic policies, some viable economic objectives. I would like to see Kamala Harris doing something of that nature. I haven't seen her done that. Maybe she's doing that behind the scenes. We don't know. But it's weird that she would not be talking about her father as often as she speaks about her mother. Now, in her autobiography, I think I missed that, she did mention that she would go to see her father, even though Perhaps the mother would want her, but I think the courts might have allowed it while he lost custody of the children that they were supposed to have seen him during holidays and also on weekends, which she did. And, you know, we see pictures of her in Jamaica with her Jamaican family and stuff like that. So we understand that beyond seven years old, that Donald Harris had some amount of influence on his two daughters. What amount of influence? We still do not know because we have not been told by both, right? He did write an essay in which he, you know, when Kamala was suggesting that her half of her family are from Jamaica and she was implying that Jamaicans are weed smokers <laughs> and Donald Harris would not have had it because he knows that his family members were not weed smokers and would not have had anything to do with that sort of lifestyle. And he did write a, an essay about her pronouncements or unfortunate pronouncements, not understanding that there are Jamaicans who smoke marijuana and lots do not, right? So to um, stigmatize a culture that an entire culture that people are just there smoking marijuana is, you know, some sort of US ignorance. And I think she's playing to that. She's pandering to that sort of stigma that many people have of Jamaica. But, you know, Donald Harris is an intellectual and he thought that he would have debunked such uh, nonsense that were propagated by her. Now, that was interesting. It was a sort of a tr interesting sort of dynamics too, because at the end of the day, even though they might have a rocky relationship, she was on her way to becoming the vice president of the United States. And what it appears to, to me, was it that when she went on that program, she went on the breakfast uh, club or the, the breakfast, is it the breakfast club program? Yeah, that she went on. Um, was she running for the presidency? I can't remember. She was on the debate. I think it was sometimes in 2019. So she at that time, she might have been um, on the debate stage where she was trying to um, participate in the, well, she participated rather in the primary debates for nomination for the presidency, for the Democratic, you know, a nominee um, to run for the presidency in 2020, which of course she dropped out um, of that race prematurely. Now, the point of the matter, and the, the point I would like to raise here as I talk about her bizarre, you know, relationship with her father, Kamala Harris, when she graduated from Westmount High School in, in Canada, went to Howard University, where she pursued a double, you know, career. She pursued um, double degrees, right? So she had a double major, I should say, in political science and economics. So I would think that her father would have had some amount of impact on her and her decision to pursue economics. And... Donald Harris did say in his in in his in his essay when um that he wrote regarding um when she made that unfortunate comment that half of her family are from Jamaica and therefore would be marijuana smokers he did say that Donald Harris did mention that Kamala Harris you know when he took them both of them to but she would have been the older of the two. And, you know, so I guess, you know, he perhaps would have had more serious dialogue with her. I don't know. And I'm just here speculating. 
But the fact is that when he took her to Jamaica, or both of them to Jamaica, that is um, her sister and Kamala, that he would, you know, bring her to different communities in Jamaica, um, communities which were rich and communities that were poor. And he would explain the whole matter of the inequities of the system, right, of the Western capitalist system, I would think. So I would think from that time that would have fostered in Kamala Harris some amount of critical thinking about economics and the role that economics plays in shaping um, socioeconomic realities. Because, you know, it is a result of policies pursued by governments where you that in, in which you have, you know, few people being very rich and the very many ending up being very poor. And I'm sure that Donald Harris, being an excellent communicator, would have explained that to her and the privileges that she would live in the United States and how you know economies like Jamaica um often give free lunch to the United States, you know, through um the policies for that uh, the, the, the policies that have been imposed by you know, neoliberal institutions at the World Bank and the IMF, because, you know, in which Jamaicans have to pay high interest rates and they have to, you know, um, forego investing in social, in the social amenities of the country. So I'm sure her father would have explained these things to her and these matters would have piqued her interest. And I am surmising that it is on that basis, it's, it's on those grounds that she decided to pursue a career, her first degree in, in, um, in economics and political science. Now she went on to the University of California um, at the Hastings School, the Hastings College, I think, the Hastings College or Hastings or Hastings College. I think it might have been Hastings College to pursue a legal career right, a, a career in the legal profession. And she completed her studies because she left Howard in 1986, having gotten um, a double major degrees, two degrees, um, one in political science and economics. And then she moved on to study, to pursue studies um, in law at the University of California. Now, she, uh, having left Howard in 1986, she went to the university and she pursued her career in, in, in law, graduated in 1989, um, sat for the bars. She, she failed the bars in 1989, but she went back and she um, uh, redid the bars in 1990 and she got it, right? And then she became a full-fledged lawyer in 1990. So evidently, you know, she she keeps on talking about, she keeps, you know, Kamala Harris repeats ad nauseum um, in her memoir and also in other biographical books that have been written about her, about her desire, this profound, you know, desire to shape policies that would create equity and equality and that she was an advocate for social justice Right. These are very, very common uh, statements made in her memoir and other um, biographies that have been written about her. Not many books are out there about her, but I've read a few. And she keeps on repeating and I'm saying nauseatingly that she did not pursue law because she wanted to ascend to a powerful position but she wanted to pursue, she wanted to effectuate, as it were, um, social laws that would, uh, you know, dispense social justice. And for that reason, she went into law, she pursued a career in law. And then, of course, she went on to becoming a lot of first, right? She became the first San Francisco, well, female San Francisco prosecutor, then she went to become the first female Black and South Asian, you know, all of these identities that the United States likes to use, which does not matter. But that's back to the United States and its culture, so people have to understand that identity politics plays a very critical role in U.S. politics, <laughs> right? Sometimes it's almost childish, and it's almost like people are so obsessed with people's 
gender and their race and all the nonsense that they talk about. But anyway, she became the first female and Black and South Asian prosecutor in San Francisco. And then she became uh, the first female and Black and South Asian attorney general of California in, I think it was in 2010, um, I believe, right, that she actually, a C, uh, you know, she, she got that position or she earned that position, um, if you will. But it's very strange that her father has not received any amount of attention. And he was the one here, there was a, an article written here in the New York Times after the convention by Erica L. Green, and she's a White House correspondent covering Kamala Harris's presidential campaign. And this was written on August 24, 2024, and it says, run, Kamala, run. And these were the words of Donald Harris, because she said that, you know, why she, when her father, when they were still married, when she, you know, Donald Harris and his wife were still married, that they would often visit the park. And that, you know, while the mother would like Kamala to be close to her parents, that, you know, she was always, as a child, would be active and she would run and she would move around the park. And her father was the one to say, run, Kamala, run, right? That is what he would say often to her, right? And it, you know, it's interesting because she says that when Donald Harris is uttered those words to his, his young daughter more than 50 years ago, he was encouraging her to whip freely through the parks of Oakland, California, not seek the highest elected office in the country. But in her address accepting the nomination as a Democratic presidential nominee, Vice President Kamala Harris said it was these words that helped inspire her. So here she's saying that these words inspire her when her father told her to run, Kamala, run. Right? I mean, it's inspired courage in her. Yet still, we hear little about the father. She speaks, you know, ad nauseum about Shaimala. Gopala Harris and speaks very little about her father, even though he imbibed this amount of courage in her, according to her narrative. It was a rare homage to her father, prominent economist, but fleeting figure in her life, who has largely been a footnote in her personal and political story. The first Black scholar to receive tenure in Stanford University's economics department, Dr. Harris remains a professor emeritus there and turned 86 the day after his daughter gave the most important speech of her life at the Democratic National Convention. So here we have Kamala Harris having a prominent father, a world-class economist, and someone who should be able to advise her in terms of articulating clearly, explicitly, her economic policies to move America forward. And based on what I have noted, I mean, when you go on her side, she doesn't have any policy platform. Um, she often is not able to give interviews that in which she renders clear understanding um, and also articulate explicitly what economic policies she would be pursuing uh, different from what the Biden administration is currently pursuing. There's nothing of that sort. So she could use him as an asset, but she does not, well, I don't know, but she doesn't seem to be using him. We don't know what happens or what goes on behind the scenes, but certainly she's not using him based on what we know in the public domain. Her relationship with her father is a closely guarded part of Miss Harris's life, about which she has spoken only sparingly. Her 2019 memoir, The Truth We Hold, referenced him only a handful of times. But in presenting herself as a nominee who understands the American dream through the complex lenses of personal, familial, and social struggles, Miss Harris tapped into the totality of the experiences that forged her. My father remained a part of our lives, says Ms. Harris speaking. 
we would see him on weekends and spend summers with him in Palo Alto. But it was my mother who took charge of our upbringing. She was the one most responsible for shaping us into the women we would become. Now, I understand that Donald Harris is a very controversial man and somebody who likes a very, you know, riveted and energetic debate. And Kamala Harris seems to be like that, you know, and both sisters, both Maya and Kamala, I hope I'm calling her her sister's name correctly. I think it's Maya, right? Um, they both pursue the legal profession. So obviously they like to debate and they like that sort of, you know, a, a riveting and um, synergistic conversation, right? I think they do. And I think that is coming from their father. Their mother, on the other hand, seem to have been an introvert, if you will, and one who was a scientist, a research scientist. That's what she was. And, you know, neither Kamala nor her sister is a scientist. So obviously, the father would have had some amount of influence in their lives. You know, I do not doubt that Kamala Harris did not, that the mother alone, I can see where the mother would have shaped a lot because she was with the mother, both of them, for the most part. However, you know, I'm sure that Donald Harris, being the person he was, and he or he is because he's still alive, uh, would have cemented some amount of his, you know, demeanor, his disposition, his characteristics, his traits in her. Right? I'm sure that he would have done that when she went to visit him on weekends and also when she went to spend vacations um, with him. Now, we have Miss Harris's father has largely declined to weigh in on his daughter's barrier-breaking political ascent in recent years, except in 2019, when he criticized the comment she made connecting her Jamaican roots to marijuana use. Since then, he has cited his aversion to seeking publicity. He did not respond to a request for comment on Saturday. So, you know, he does not want to be a part of Kamala's, you know, presidential uh, life, as it were, the public life that she is, you know. And I think that he has said that he's not willing, he's not about to participate in the, what you call it now, the sort of reality <laughs> show. I mean, these are my words that the presidency, the American presidency is all about right now. He's not willing to participate in that sort of, you know, Right, TV shows, you know, um, and and that is what American politics really has found itself in right now. It's not about substance. It's all about, you know, a reality TV show in which you have these so-called entertainers, these political entertainers, I should say, who strive for the mastery. Who is the one that can entertain you most and make you laugh or anger you the most? <laughs> and then you decide to vote or not vote for that political entertainer, right? That is what it's uh, all about. But it's very interesting that Kamala decides to be quiet about quiet about her father. There's a silence, a deafening silence in terms of, you know, we need to hear a little bit more about that relationship, whether it's good or it's bad. They good, the bad, and the indifferent. Now, Vice President Kamala Harris is coming from Fox News, has frequently cited her upbringing and family as she crisscrosses the nation in an effort to rally support for her newly formed presidential campaign, including touting her father in a rare mansion at the DNC. And she says here, I'm quoting Kamala Harris, my early memories of her parents together are very joyful ones, a home filled with laughter and music. So it's the whole matter of the campaign of laughter and joy. Aretha, Coltrane, and Miles at the park. My mother would say, stay close. But my father would say, as he smiled, run, Kamala, run. Don't be afraid. Don't let anything stop you. From my earliest years, he taught me to be fearless, Harris said during her acceptance speech during the DNC in Chicago last Thursday. And I think it's the first time that she has ever mentioned that much about him in a public event, which was good that she gave him his props. You know, so that was something that was interesting, but she has not said much afterwards. It's still her mother, her mother. Now, one of the things that I've 
been thinking, I've been contemplating as I you know, prepared this video is the fact that it seems to me that even during Barack Obama's presidency, where his father was not much a part of his life, is Kamala trying to create some form of parallel between she and Barack Hussein Obama? I wondered also that we are seeing the feminization, the feminization, <laughs> am I coming to the, you know, in which the presidency of the United States, you know, is being, you know, feminized, as it were. And you have to leave that feminine impression, that feminine mark upon the presidency. And you have to talk about this strong mother without the presence of a father. It all really jives well into this feminist ideology. And that's what I'm thinking, that she's trying to craft, as it were, this narrative suggesting that it was her mother alone, a strong mother, who was able to bring her up without her father. But is that true? We understand that the parents were separated and eventually divorced, but we know that Kamala did get some support from her father. So I'm sure that he does not leave her and, the, and her sister for the mother to take care of without any assistance, economic and psychological and, and, and other forms of support. But she's giving us that impression. Obama also, you know, grew up largely without his father. And I think that, that and you know, he grew up mostly with his mother and grandmother. And this is the sort of story, this is sort of narrative that we're getting. But is it just a narrative and uh, are we really being told the full truth? I don't think we are being told the full truth. I think that these are narratives shaped to give us the illusion that women can do it alone. All right? That is the sort of impression that I'm getting. And of course, we applaud those women who are out there, who are struggling and they have no other option but to take care of their children by themselves because they have neither economic or social or psychological support. So definitely, I would like to really acknowledge and to applaud those women, those single parent women out there who are doing the best to grow up their children. But women also have to be very careful of not indoctrinating their children into believing that women can grow children by themselves and vice versa fathers ought not to give their children those who are single parent fathers that they are the only ones or they can grow children by themselves because it takes two to raise a child very you need that motherly and fatherly support and you know Sustenance. So this is what I would like to say. I think that Kamala is creating a narrative and the narrative is supposed to be that her super, the superwoman, the superwoman, which is her mother, Shaimala Gopalan, was able to raise her on her own and that she received most of the support from her single mom. But I'm not going to argue with Kamala because, you know, of course, we don't know the full story and she was the one who lived the reality. However, I know that her father, particularly as he lived in the United States, would have had to lend some support to his daughters. And the mother, who was a strong mother, would have insisted that he did. How much time Kamala spent with her father, we don't know. How much the influence was that he had on her, we still don't know because Kamala has not been forthright with us. You know, in 2003, she was on record uh, when she, in an interview with the San Francisco Daily, of saying that her father is a good guy. She said that. These were her words that my father is a good guy, but we are not close. That is end of quote. That is what she said. She says that my father is a good guy, but we are not close. That is what she said in 2003. Not 2023, but 2003. I beg your pardon. Fast forward to 2021. Or, yeah, I think it was at that time. She said that, you know, 
she and her father had a good relationship. You know, they were on good terms. So we don't know if the relationship improved after 2003, but if the relationship had improved, wouldn't we be hearing more of her father? And there are some people who say that, yes, he doesn't want to be involved, but he doesn't have to be involved in, he has already said that he does not want to be involved in her public life. Donald Harris is on record of saying that. However, she could acknowledge the different, you know, um, roles that he played and the influence that he might have had on her life and on her public life, as well as her private life, and even on her education. Was he grooming her to become an economist? Why did she pursue a career in economics at Howard University? These are the questions I would like to ask. Why is she so silent on her father's um, relationship or influence in her life? That's the question. But let me end this video. I hope that you will like, will share, and will subscribe. I look forward to seeing you in another video. All the best.